the humanities division, when I was a medical student, I went to college and medical school at the University of Chicago, and I became Richard's teaching assistant one summer when he was teaching an undergraduate class in literature and medicine. And um, it was an absolutely, that's really where I got to know him, and it was an absolutely amazing experience. Anybody who's ever been lucky enough to sit with Richard in a classroom and uh, think deep thoughts with him is, uh, it's really it's sort of a life-changing experience. So I, I mean, I must say that I didn't really serve to teach very much, but I certainly learned a ton as his TA uh, that summer. So it was a, just a great experience. And then I was lucky enough to come here a few years after Richard uh, came back. We're both Indiana natives. And I went to Chicago and you went to Wabash College. But, and I don't think we ever beat you in basketball. <laughs> But in any case, um, he, we've asked Richard, we, we ask Richard to come back every year and uh, talk at this lecture series, and we tell him he can talk about anything that he wants. Uh, so this is what he's going to be talking about this year. Thanks very much to everybody for coming. Thanks, Paul. It's a treat to be here. I hope you'll find this uh, provocative. We'll, we'll see. Uh, it's a new talk. It's about ethics and democracy. Who's that? <laughs> Coneheads, a uh, buddy of mine, Scott Massey, used to be the president of the Indiana Council, uh, Humanities Council. I think he's now at, down at Cumberland University in Tennessee, although I'm not sure of that. Uh, but when he was president of the IHC, Indiana Humanities Council, he invited uh, some dignitaries from France to visit uh, Indianapolis. And they toured the city. They went to uh, a home for battered women. They went to uh, a homeless shelter, and they went to uh, an HIV-AIDS clinic, all of which had been set up uh, basically as volunteer organizations. And uh, at the end of the day, after seeing these sites, uh, they, they met for a kind of debriefing, and the, the uh, head of the French delegation said, you know, this is all very good. We admire a lot what you've done, but... Uh, Please answer one question. Who authorizes this activity? Who authorizes this activity? So I'll come back to that in a wee while. But uh, that to me is a, a good starting point for thinking about the relationship between ethics. Everybody recognizes them, right? Who are they? The Coneheads. Specifically who? Well, that's true. That's the actor's name. I was hoping to get the Conehead's names, but uh, Beldar, for example, on the right, right? And uh, anybody know where the Coneheads hail from? Yes, we are from France, right? Something like that. Uh, by the way, that's not Gilda Radner in the middle. She was deemed uh, to appear to be too old to play that role by the time the Conehead films were made. So that's uh, Michelle Phillips. But Jane Curtin on the left and Dan Aykroyd on the right. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Uh, so these are the themes I want to talk about today uh, under the general rubric of democracy, government, character, association, and faith. And uh, one of the most important documents in the history of democracy is there on the right. What's that? Yeah, that's the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, one of several of the most important uh, documents in the history of human democracy. What year? 1215. So it's uh, quite an old document. and We'll be celebrating its, uh, what, uh, 900th anniversary in the not-too-distant future, an important chapter in the history of human government. So let's start out talking about government this is a nice uh, chart produced uh, or a graph, graphic produced by the Economist's e uh, uh, Intelligence Unit showing systems of a government across the globe. The greener a country is, the more democratic its government. The redder it is, the less democratic. So you notice the United States is not the most among the most democratic of nations, although we're certainly pretty democratic. There are different ways of uh, governing human states. Uh, anarchy, which would be the absence of government. 
uh, autocracy, where one person is in charge, oligarchy, where a few people are in charge, and then democracy, where in theory every citizen or every member has a role in government. We, we are way too fixated on the governmental dimension of democracy. We think far too much in our education and our lives of, of democracy as a system of government. So uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages to centralized and decentralized government. A very centralized government might be an autocracy. Uh, th that kind of system can be quite nimble. If all you need is a choice by one person, you may be able to get a decision this afternoon. If you need to get, say, the faculty senate to vote approval of a particular motion, it may be six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. Some of us participated in the so-called effort to extend the tenure track uh, clock at Indiana University. That was not a decision made on a dime. It was made on, uh, you know, Fort Knox, I guess. Uh, Another issue is that centralized governments tend to be relatively conservative, partly because those in charge of them want to maintain the status quo, uh, whereas uh, decentralized governments are sometimes more innovative. And finally, uh, decentralized governments are at least in theory able to take advantage of a broader spectrum of viewpoints. I could go on and on about this, but I just want to indicate that there are some advantages and disadvantages from decentralized or centralized systems of government. Uh, just to give you a sense of the power of numbers, who was Francis Galton? Cousin of Charles Darwin? Francis Galton? Very important person in... Uh, British biology and in a way in British politics, but uh, and he was quite an elitist. He, he, he was really one of the progenitors of what we call intelligence testing, uh, which, you know, which is used for purposes very different from uh, those for which it was designed. But Francis Galton went to a fair in the 19th century in England, and there was a prize steer there, and you could lay down your bet, say a dollar, and guess the weight of that steer. And they received a total of 800 guesses, so there was $800 in the pot, and uh, it turned out that not one of those 800 guesses was correct. Nobody won. But if you average the weights each person had guessed and divided them by the number of guesses, the number you came up with was 1,197 pounds. The actual weight of that spear was 1,198 pounds. So the theory is if you can aggregate a lot of uh, judgments or estimates, uh, you may come much closer to the truth than you try if you try to uh, rely on a single person. That could have implications for how we run the federal or state government or, uh, you know, medical practices or health systems. This uh, anecdote is recounted in James Surowiecki's The Wisdom of Crowds. Again, the idea is that many people may be more reliable than one person, but you need to find a way to help them communicate with each other and uh, basically aggregate their judgments, perhaps even to collaborate with one another in a rising uh, arriving at those judgments. Some people running organizations want their executive board to rubber stamp their decisions. So my corporate board is stocked with people who I believe are going to vote me a very generous compensation package. I'm really not interested in what they have to say about our organization or how it could perform better. I simply want them to uh, rubber stamp my will. Other people have executive boards that they really expect to play an active role in, uh, in formulating policy. Those are two very different organizations in which to live. One you might call a tyranny or autocracy. The other would be something else. What kind of organizations do you function in? To what degree do the people you report to uh, want your input, want, want to have an opportunity uh, for you to share your perspectives, and to what degree do they want you to do what you're told? 
You could, you know, you could tell what kind of organization do I work in? How often do the people I work for genuinely uh, solicit my perspective? You, you can make your own diagnosis. Uh, democracy is a powerful trend. This is an estimate of the number of nations in the world that would qualify as, as democratic. And in the year 1800, that was very, very few. And as you can see, it's climbed more or less steadily since then. There's a worldwide trend toward greater and greater democracy. Why that is, is another question. Uh, but we live in a very democratic age. Governments have moved dramatically in the direction of democracy, away from autocracy or monarchy. Uh, and, you know, how does democracy reflect itself in government? Well, you can have a direct referendum. The, the citizens can approve the laws directly. You can have elections, say, in a republic where the elected officials uh, to some degree respond to the will of the people. You can have public debates. There's one tonight, right? I think in Denver, Obama and Romney, right? That's, that's a kind of democracy. Uh, there's democracy in classrooms. In some classrooms, the professor stands up in front, the stage on the sa sage on the stage, and tells everyone what to memorize. In other classrooms, people might be seated around a table or in a roughly ovoid configuration and uh, share perspectives with one another. What's the best model for education? And uh, even families may be more or less democratic. What role do your children play in uh, formulating family decisions? No role because they're incompetent, or you know, do do they have a say? Uh, who are the heroes? Who's that? That's easy, right? Lincoln and Douglas. Uh, who are our heroes in government today? Well, I'd suggest there are people like George Washington. Uh, thinking about the founding of the United States, what what do these three people have in common? They're all presidents, more specifically. They're the first three presidents, right? Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. We think of them as the heroes of democracy. This is where we lead ourselves fairly seriously astray. We think of the American tradition of democracy as being rooted in government officials, and that's important. It's very important that our officials be attached to democracy. But in point of fact, when you think about the kind of country the United States uh, is or became uh, over 200 years ago, there were other people who were least, at least as important who, from our point of view, did not hold elective office. I think Ben Franklin could be said to be the quintessential and perhaps most important American. And by the way, he was governor of Pennsylvania for three terms. But in terms of the founding of the United States, he didn't hold any offices. Who's that guy? That's Thomas Paine, author of the all-time greatest American bestseller. There's no book in U.S. history that ever sold more copies uh, per population, per capita, than Thomas Paine's Common Sense, which is basically a plea uh, for democracy. Patrick Henry, what did he say? Give me liberty or li give me death, right, before the House of Burgesses in, in the state of Virginia, uh, leading uh, Virginia to help fund the revolutionary effort. And Samuel Adams, these are immensely important people. They didn't hold office, but they were, right, yeah, the beer, exactly. He, he was a brewmeister, dabbled in politics, but, you know, the frothy stuff was his, his principal calling. Uh, and this is basically what Tom Paine says in Common Sense. Among other things, ordinary people can make wise judgments. You don't have to have a Ph.D., a master's degree, or even a bachelor's degree, right? Anybody know where uh, Bill Gates graduated from college? John D. Rockefeller? What college did he attend? Richest person in American history. Where did Abraham Lincoln go to college? He didn't. Where did he go to high school? He didn't, right? He had two years, maybe two years of formal schooling. Where did George Washington go to college? He didn't, right? The indispensable American never went to college. Uh, ordinary people are capable of a lot 
if only we have the courage to trust them. And the other notion is there's a body of popular wisdom which is accessible to anyone. People actually have a lot of common sense. And if we appeal to that, our uh, government uh, may be stronger. But my point here is that we don't want to associate democracy primarily with government, but with other things, one of them being the development of human character. It turns out that democracy is the best way to govern if you want the citizens to realize their full humanity. If you're going to be the most capable person you can and contribute the most you're able, it's desirable that you function in a democratic context because it's a democratic system of government or culture that will invite you to assume the most responsibility. We can only be as big as the responsibilities we enjoy, and it's democracy more than any other system that challenges us uh, to, to accept that responsibility. Who's that? Paintings by the greatest painter in human history. Rembrandt, correct. And who's that? No. It's Aristotle pondering the bust of Homer. Uh, democracy is important for good government. Democracy fosters good citizenship, but as Aristotle saw, the, the principal advantage of democracy was that it made the most of the humanity of every citizen. Right? Aristotle's Ethics, the greatest treatise on ethics ever written, ends with an invitation to read Aristotle's Politics because you can only really cultivate human character in the right community. And you can really only have the right community, the best community, if you cultivate human character. So ethics and politics need to work together collaboratively. Yeah, it may be a kind of rejection of Aristotle's own teacher, Plato. That's a vexed question, but there's certainly, I think, an element of truth in that. What's that? Yeah, that's uh, that's the Acropolis with the Parthenon. They're... Uh, there at the top. Uh, character matters for governance. Can you trust Barack Obama? Can you trust Mitt Romney? Can you trust, uh, oh, I don't know, Mike Pence or Joe Donnelly? I mean, pick, pick a candidate. That's a big question. Are these people trustworthy? Their character has a big impact on our assessment of their fitness to govern. Will they make the right decisions? But in point of fact, the decisions made by our government are much less important than the kind of culture we represent. You might think that's not true. Try this. Take the United States Constitution, the Constitution of the United States, and make it the law of land, the land in Afghanistan. From now on, the Afghani people will govern themselves according to the U.S. Constitution. What do you think? Wouldn't work. Why not? Because democracy is not the foundation. Democracy is an edifice erected on a foundation of culture, which may have its roots, if you trust the great German sociologist Max Weber, in things like Protestantism. The idea that each of us is responsible for his or her own salvation, that we need to read the Bible for ourselves and uh, come to grips with it for ourselves. So the conscience, the rationality, uh, the character of every person is important. I don't know if Max Weber was right by, about that, but uh, whatever it is, you can't simply install a democracy in any country, in any culture in the world. Democracy only works if people are in a certain kind of culture with a certain conception of what constitutes a good life. You just can't walk into North Korea and say, effective tomorrow, you are an American-style democracy. It won't work. People have to think and see themselves and their place in the larger order of human affairs, perhaps even in the larger order of creation, 
in a certain sense if democracy is going to have a chance to succeed. And I think that's really where the dialogue around democracy should be focused. What you do as a voter is puny and unimportant compared to what you do as a citizen and a human being. And uh, we too easily forget that. We sport our little buttons, right? I voted. Oh, look at me. I voted. I'm hot stuff. If that's all you've done, that's an abrogation of your democratic responsibility. That's a kind of icing on the cake at best. What we need today is the cake, not more icing. We really can't assess the health of our democracy by the percentage of eligible voters who cast a ballot however much uh, some people might encourage us to suppose that's the case. So democracy is not about governance. It's not about legislation or the enforcement of legislation or the interpretation of legislation. Democracy is primarily about character. And nobody understood that better than this person. Who's that? Pericles. Yeah, this is Pericles, his famous funeral oration in Thucydides' Uh, history of the Peloponnesian War. We do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. Now you might say, are, are you canvassing voters? Are you making calls in the evening? You know, or are you writing checks to the state Democratic or Republican Party? That is absolutely not what Pericles meant. You could have nothing to do with Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or the Green Party or the Christian Democrats and be a very important politician in this sense. For example, you could be a teacher in the public schools who fosters a deep understanding in her students of what democracy really is. That would be to take a big role in democracy, whether you ever cast a ballot or not. Here's another line from Thucydides' funeral oration. Instead of looking on discussion as a stumbling block in the way of action, we think of it as an indispensable preliminary to any action at all. What's the quality of conversation in your life? High, low, non-existent? See, there are two things at work here. One, the quality of our decision-making can never, except by chance, blind chance, exceed the quality of our conversation. The quality of our decision-making can never exceed the quality of our conversation. But more importantly, the quality of our lives can never exceed the quality of our conversation. Our lives can only be as good as the conversations we have. Pericles thought we need to devote a lot of time to enhancing the quality of conversation. Think of the organizations you're a part of. Are they helping to build better conversations? Are they convening good people around good topics for good conversation? Or are they tending to ignore conversation and perhaps even squelch conversation? That's how you can tell the degree to which your organization is democratic and has the potential to bring out the best in the people who function within it. So it's, it's simply not the case that you discharge your democratic responsibility by casting a ballot. That's a tiny thing. I'm not, by the way, not trying to discourage anybody from voting, far from it, but but if we think we're doing a good job because we're voting, we're kidding ourselves and we're betraying the, uh, the ideals of our founders who thought to encourage a robust engagement uh, on the part of citizens in, in the life of their community and their nation. So voting is not insignificant, but it's not very important. Far more important are the views you express and invite others to express in day-to-day -day life about how our lives should be ordered. You know, what should the profession of medicine or the profession of nursing or the profession of social work or the profession of chaplaincy be doing in the year 2012? What kind of needs exist in our community, in our society, uh, that we could do a better job of serving? 
right? What are, what are your views on that subject? When was the last time you heard somebody express a view on that subject? If the answer is, gee, I'm not sure, but I know it's been a long time, then we've got our work cut out for us. But ultimately, uh, we're only going to be as good as our ideas. Where do you get ideas? Two main places, reading and conversation. How often do you meet with the people you work with to read things and talk about them? If the answer to that is, I don't remember, then we've got our work cut out for us. As Democrats, right? People who believe in democracy, we've got our work cut out for us. What is the quality of reading and the quality of conversation in your professional and personal life? If the answer is poor, then we've got a lot of work to do. And that's, that's the, the kind of work that the, the geniuses who promoted democracy as a system of government for the United States had in mind. Suffrage, the casting of a ballot, was a little thing. You, you, Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, was the greatest student of America ever. When he visited the United States in the 1820s, women could not cast a ballot. That would come a century later. No women could cast a ballot. Women's suffrage was a big deal in the late 19th and early 20th century because women, simply by virtue of being female, could not cast a ballot. You know what Tocqueville said was the genius of American democracy? It's wives and mothers. Tocqueville said the single thing that makes America the greatest democracy in the history of humanity is its wives and mothers. How could that be if it's primarily by casting ballots that we exercise our democratic responsibility? The answer is it's not. The key to democracy isn't the capacity to cast a ballot. It's being well-educated. And who educated the character of Americans? Who shaped the honesty the generosity, uh, the trustworthiness, the courage of Americans, wives and mothers, right? They were the moral teachers, the moral shapers of the citizenry of the United States. They were the single most important ingredient, even though they wouldn't get the right to vote for another hundred years. See, it's ideas, it's education that's the soul of democracy. So uh, that's actually Patrick Henry giving his speech, give me liberty or give me death. You know, Washington and Jefferson were the audience. It said when he finished his speech, everybody in the room stood up spontaneously and shouted, give me liberty or give me death. That includes George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. I mean, we needed Washington. We needed Jefferson. But what we needed above all were ideas around which human beings could coalesce and take on a new sense of mission. And it was people like Patrick Henry who provided those ideas, the single best-selling work in the history of the United States. Uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and I don't know of any speech except perhaps those of Lincoln, like the Gettysburg Address, that's more frequently quoted or more frequently memorized by elementary school, school students. What's that? Twelve Angry Men, directed by, it's a who's who of American acting. Who directed it? Sidney Lumet, right? Tocqueville on the jury system. Why do we have the jury system in the United States? Possibility number one, because juries produce the most just verdicts. If you rely on juries, you're most likely to get the just verdict wrong. Tocqueville said that's not why the jury system is such a, a work of genius. The reason we have a jury system is because when people are impaneled as jurors and are called upon to, to make a decision in a civil or criminal case, they understand more deeply than ever before what it means to be a citizen. Serving on a jury is a school of democracy. We need to make sure that as many of our fellow community members serve on juries as possible, if Tocqueville is right. And of course, what's the standard in medicine? As soon as the judge sees, as soon as the bailiff sees your MD, you're dismissed, right? Doctors are too important to serve on juries, right? Their schedules are too busy. 
the healthcare system can't spare them. That's like saying we, we don't care whether our physicians learn what it means to be a citizen of a democracy. So one key is not governments, but character, and another key is association. Shortest president in U.S. history, who's that? 5-4. Who's he? Author of the U.S. Constitution. Who wrote the U.S. Constitution? Remember what I said about education, schools of democracy? <laughs> You see, you think because you're going to vote early in November that you're fit to live in a democracy. But, uh, you know, it's really the education uh, that matters, not whether you exercise your privilege of suffrage. So that's James Madison, future president of the United States. Madison worried about the tyranny of the majority. One way democracies can go wrong is that the, the majority lurches off in a bad direction. And it's a disaster for the state. How do you correct that? You make sure all citizens take their democratic responsibility seriously. And even when they're in the minority, serve as effective advocates for their point of view. That's the way you, pre I mean, you have a system of checks and balances and divided powers. But uh, ultimately, it's our taking our responsibility seriously as members of minorities that helps to prevent the tyranny of majority. This is Hobbes' Leviathan, the first great work of, or maybe second great work of modern political philosophy. Uh, concern about the tyranny of a central authority. What do central authorities do? They homogenize. They produce conformity. So if you're on a quality and safety committee, you're trying to figure out how to get all the nurses to do the same thing the same way every time. And if they don't deviate from that practice, we'll reduce error rates, right? We want conformity. Conformity is good in the short term. In the long term, it's a disaster because uh, conformity and, and, and mentality of conformity squelches risk-taking and innovation. If medicine in the year 2012 is as good as it can possibly be, then we want to maximize conformity with currently accepted practices. If, on the other hand, medicine still has a long way to go, then forcing conformity on nurses or doctors or social workers or chaplains is, is going to constrain progress, right? Part of the genius of democracy is that good ideas keep bubbling up to the surface, and sometimes we act on those ideas. And then a third problem faced by democracies in the sphere of association. Anybody recognize that guy? Yeah, that's Atlas. Maybe some of you may know Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, Ayn Rand, by the way, wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. Makes me wince. Um, the, the one danger of democracy is egoism. Each of us retreats into our own little private sphere and enjoys the pleasures of life, you know, with my uh, flat screen TV, right? Or my uh, 4G device. I just kind of, you know, I go home every evening and watch TV in my own, you know, my home is my castle. And I'm not engaged with my neighbors. In fact, I don't even know their names. Do they have children? I'm not sure. What do they do for a living? No idea. You know, that's a problem for democracy. We need to move out of egoism and concern for what's good for me or what I enjoy and look for opportunities to serve in the neighborhood or the community. Maybe some of you may know Robert uh, Putnam's uh, Bowling Alone, right? 30 years ago, you went into a bowling alley. There are a bunch of people in leagues, right? Today, you go into a bowling alley. There are a bunch of solo bowlers. Is that symptomatic of something happening in the broader American culture? Are we less engaged with our neighbors and our fellow citizens than we used to be? We need to foster voluntary associations. That's Tocqueville's word, not mine. The greatest student of American history, we need more voluntary associations because it's through voluntary associations that we really learn what it's like to be a citizen of a democracy. This is a Boy Scout troop on a, uh, on a canoeing trip. Uh, are you part of a book group? 
Have you been or are you involved in scouting? Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts? Do you participate in any athletic clubs? Are you involved in teaching Sunday school? Uh, do you serve in some faith community? It doesn't matter what the answers to these questions are exactly, but Tocqueville thought the genius of America, other than its women, was voluntary associations. People could notice an opportunity or a need and simply coalesce around meeting that need. That's where some of our biggest organizations came from. That's where the first uh, American universities came from, for example, was uh, voluntary associations. So there's a, anybody know who founded the Boy Scouts? BP, right? Baden Powell, that's right. So uh, Tocqueville thought that association was the best guardian against the tyranny of the majority because you'd have robust minority groups representing their point of view. It was the best guardian against tyranny of central authority where you simply do what the people in charge tell you. And it was the best guard against the tyranny of egoism. Why? I'm not just in this for myself. I'm in this for my neighbors, for my community. My life is our life. I need to serve this larger group uh, it, to, to lead the kind of life of which uh, I'm capable. So association, Tocqueville would have said, is the antidote to egoism. Political parties are one such form of association, but there are many, many others. And what do we learn when we act together locally? We learn how interdependent we are on each other. No, no better way to learn that than a disaster. Maybe you've ridden the elevator with the same people every day for years whose names you don't know. How do you fix that? The elevator breaks down, right? 10, 20, 30 minutes. Pretty soon you know everybody's name. Pretty soon you feel like part of the same team in a way you never did before. I'm, I'm not saying we want to court disaster, but, uh, you know, dire need helps us realize how truly interdependent we are on each other. How can we cultivate that kind of awareness uh, absent another Hurricane Katrina, right? So uh, who's that? Ben Franklin, the greatest master of voluntary association in U.S. history. Started the first secular university, the University of Pennsylvania. Co-founded the first hospital in the United States. The first lending library the first uh, volunteer fire department, I could go on and on. Franklin was the master of voluntary association. Why did he believe so much in voluntary associations? Because he thought they serve as catalysts to draw us together. They help us recognize that we share a lot more interests than we commonly suppose. And incidentally, they actually help prepare people to serve for offices, uh, serve in offices in the government. Franklin, arguably the greatest American, somebody who invested tremendous effort in helping the citizens of the United States become more, better human beings, individually and collectively. What was his great literary work? Poor Richard's Almanac. That was for ordinary people. That was about educating ordinary people, getting us thinking about what kind of lives we really want to lead. It's, it's, it's a work of educational genius, and it could only happen in a democracy. That's the last thing an autocrat would produce, poor Richard's almanac. So fine, now we get to something really uh, potentially problematic for some of us, namely the issue of faith. That's actually a man praying at a Shinto shrine. Uh, faith teaches us some important lessons, at least so, uh, so people like Tocqueville thought. One is uh, that there are realities higher than the state. What would that mean? Say in this context, Riley Hospital is very important. The welfare of Riley Hospital is near and dear to each of us, but Riley Hospital isn't the ultimate. It serves a higher purpose, namely caring for the sick and needy of the state of Indiana, something like that. You tell me what its mission is. Riley Hospital, very important. That mission, even more important. And we can judge how well Riley Hospital is performing by how well it's meeting that mission, right? Faith teaches us that there are some things important in life that we don't vote on. 
we cast very few ballots about your family, for example, or your conscience. Those, in fact, are not subject to the ballot, at least in general terms, but they're vitally important. And another advantage of faith, Tocqueville thought, was that it encouraged us to to adopt a long-term outlook. Maybe you've read the book of Genesis. It's got long passages, in fact, whole chapters that are simply genealogies. So-and-so begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so who, you know, what are those doing there? Nobody likes to read those. (laughs) Why keep them in there? Answer, because they show us that human life is multi-generational, that you can't understand who you are in a way unless you know who your grandparents and great-grandparents were, and you can't make good decisions today unless you're thinking in the context of your yet unborn grandchildren and great-grandchildren. If you're not doing right by them, you're not doing right by anybody. We have a tendency to collapse our time horizon and see only about the tips of our own noses. But uh, the book of Genesis is all about thinking about multiple generations, perhaps even something beyond that, not just a long time, but maybe even the perspective of eternity. We can't understand what we're doing in our lives unless we look at it from, attempt to look at it from a kind of eternal perspective. I don't know if you find that plausible or not. Who's that? He's standing in front of a work that brought uh, $18.5 million at the beginning of the financial crisis of 2008, the very day that uh, the U.S. economy took a dramatic turn for the worse. That piece of art was sold for $18.5 million. Anybody? One of the best-known artists of our time. That's Damien Hirst, and he's standing in front of a work of art called The Golden Calf. Why is faith important? Well, according to uh, Tocqueville, it's because uh, faith teaches us to regard the perspectives of others not with contempt, but with curiosity and with courtesy. If, If everybody counts in the grand scheme of things, then what they have to say deserves some attention and respect. doesn't mean everybody's opinion is equal, but there's nobody whose views we can rule out of bounds simply because they speak a different language or come from a different culture or uh, don't have as many letters behind their names or don't have uh, as good a financial portfolio as we do. Even the poor and the downtrodden count for something and in some respects count just for just as much as the, uh, the rich and the powerful. Secondly, uh, faith encourages us to regard government not as an idol, not as a golden calf. If only we could elect the right candidate to the presidency, our problems would be solved. How could anybody suppose that to be the case? Uh, but in fact, see it for what it is. Namely, our government is a tool. Just like Riley Hospital is a tool in service of some higher end according to which its performance as a tool needs to be judged. And finally, even our society isn't the government. The federal government, the state governments are not our society. From the standpoint of faith, uh, society is always bigger than the government. Just think about the conversations that take place around your dinner table, and I hope there are some from time to time. Uh, The government doesn't know about those conversations, but that doesn't mean they're not important. And in fact, they may be far more important than what's being discussed uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives today. So uh, this is Rembrandt's uh, The Parable of the Prodigal Son. Here are some propositions that are essential to democracy. Democracy rests on a foundation of something like faith, something like religion. doesn't mean every citizen of a democracy has to be religious, but to be true Democrats, they have to uh, be standing on some foundation that the government itself cannot provide. And what's that? Well, one of those uh, precepts would be that there's no higher good than a human person. And it's the welfare and thriving of human people that matters most. 
Another one would be that human beings have rights that pre-exist the, the state, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, unalienable, right? This doesn't come from the United States of America. The United States of America is recognizing those rights. It rests on that foundation. Another one, precept, every person is called to full humanity. Our mission in life is to help other people become as fully human as they can. And finally, here's a deep uh, religious proposition. We're all fundamentally brothers and sisters. We forget that when we get behind the wheel of a car, don't we? You've seen the, 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 the expressions, the facial expressions, right? The hand gestures. We forget. But uh, maybe our lives would be better if we could forget less frequently or remember more deeply the, the faith-grounded precept that we're all brothers and sisters. You see, that's, that's really a foundation of democracy. So that is a self-portrait of Rembrandt called the beggar. When, uh, when Rembrandt sketched the beggar, he sketched himself. There's a famous story in, in the Bible. It goes something like, you know, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or when did we see you a stranger in jail? And the answer is, you may recall, as you did unto the least of these, my brethren, so you did unto me. In other words, we need to treat the very least among us with no less respect, striving toward no less affection than we treat the very greatest among us. Bureaucracies love hierarchies. They love organization charts. But uh, democracies love human beings. And somehow our responsibilities as citizens and human beings in a democracy should take precedence over our position on an organization chart. What's that from? The Matrix. Whose nose is that? Anybody? Morpheus, that's right. Yeah, the, the Matrix, the Wachowski brothers. Actually now no longer the Wachowski brothers. The, the Wachowski siblings, we'd have to say, right? Anyway, that's another story. Um, Morpheus presents Neo, the new man, right? The one, one being an anagram of Neo. He presents the one with a choice. The red pill or the blue pill? That's the choice with which you're presented today, the day of the first presidential debate of the uh, 2012 election cycle. Which pill are you going to choose? <laughs> you could choose, oh, it could be red and blue, right? Is this a red or a blue state? Is this a red or a blue candidate? No, that's trivial. What really matters is, are you going to choose the pill that says, I vote? I've just charged my democratic responsibility? Or are you going to choose the pill that says uh, there's a whole lot more to democracy than casting a ballot, picking a horse or a candidate? That, that, that's the most superficial aspect of democracy. Someday, those who are voiceless, our unborn children and grandchildren and great children, are going to ask us a question. A question related to the democracy that we're leaving them, their bequest, because of the way we've comported ourselves as citizens of a democracy. Someday, those voiceless children and grandchildren are going to ask us what we said on their behalf. Did dem democracy fade or brighten? Did it wither or flourish on our watch? I'm quite confident that the answer at the moment is it withered. Democracy is ailing in the United States of America in the second decade of the 21st century. It is not flourishing, it is withering. And the people who are responsible for that are seated next to you right now. And in fact, you see that person every day when you look in the mirror. We take too much for granted. And it's curious 
But the way to correct that is to take ethics seriously. If you really think our mission is to help other human beings realize their full humanity, to cultivate their character to the greatest extent possible, then you become of necessity a committed Democrat. But if we're going to realize that potential, each of us is going to have to take our responsibilities for democracy more seriously than most of us currently do. So I've talked about four things, government, character, association, and faith. Whether you're religious or not, your life rests on faith in something or some things. It might be earning power. It might be political power. It might be fame. It might be health. You have bet your life on something or some things. That's faith. When it comes to democracy, what are we betting our lives on? I have a feeling we may be squandering our lives. What about that question from the French dignitaries? Who authorizes this activity? My fine French friends. My conehead colleagues, you've got that question exactly wrong. That activity doesn't need authorization. That's a trivial question. The question is, who is moved to undertake that kind of community service? To found a new school? To, to develop a clinic to provide uh, medical care to the indigent? Right? Right? to foster better conversations in our organizations, IU Health, Riley Hospital, Center Township, the city of Indianapolis. Who's under, that's the real question. What moves people to undertake that kind of voluntary association, to commit their lives to that kind of service? If we ever become the kind of people for whom the first question is, who authorizes this activity? We've ceased to be American. We've become French. And, you know, I don't hate the French, but, you know, when they ask you, do you want to answer, we are from France? Or do you want to answer, we are from the United States? If you want to be able to give the latter answer, you've got to invest a good part of your life in, uh, in, in its legitimacy. So that, mercifully, is the last image. Who's that? The greatest book ever written about democracy happens to be the greatest novel ever written. By the way, the Nobel Institute says as much. It won. It was number one on a list of 100 greatest books of all time, and it won by a margin of more than 50%. It's Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. If we haven't read Don Quixote, we are not fully prepared to be citizens and human beings in a democracy. We're not fully prepared to develop our own character and the character of others. And that's going to have profound political implications. So I think I'll stop there, Paul. I, what We got like three or four minutes maybe? Or I'm always hoping we'll give, find some questions. Dave. How do you reconcile this notion of democracy and Ben Franklin's original people down to the creator? Because that's certainly an right so I certainly see that. So he scratches out. Jefferson's words and puts his own in there, something that people understand, with the notion that we were really founded as a plutocracy, where it was really the educated class, the wealthy class, the white males over 21 had property. That's how we were founded. Yep. I think uh, if we expect human beings like Athena to spring fully developed from our heads, we're never going to make it as educators. Any parents in the room may be able to identify with what I just said. Uh, if we expect Democrats, small d Democrats, to spring fully developed at the time of the American founding, then we're going to be disappointed. I think that the tincture of time is uh, a necessary ingredient in the evolution of the United States to a greater democracy and a greater culture. And uh, they didn't have it right initially. I mean, the biggest problem was slavery. 
The word slavery doesn't appear in the Constitution, but you got the, the, the three-fifths compromise. How can anybody who claims to care about democracy or human rights write slavery into the Constitution? They, they knew they didn't have it right, but they were taking important steps in the right direction. A lot of us left, leave, let ourselves off the hook because we say, I can't do it alone. One lifetime isn't enough, so why bother? Not good enough. You know, Abraham could have said, I can't do it alone. I can't do it in a single generation. Isaac could have said, I can't do it alone. Can't do it in a single. Jacob could have said the same thing. We've got to do what we can with the resources that are available to us. The real problem isn't we can't do everything. The real problem is we're not trying to do anything. And a whole lot of us could do a whole lot more. Please. Yeah, I didn't go back to the first slide. You mean literally? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, you didn't have to go back. That one? You just showed the uh, democracy in a, in a darker green. Oh, yeah. And you asked me a hypothetical question. If we change our voting system, would that change the shade of that? Of that uh, in a small way. It would have an effect. You know, this is a set of formal criteria, you know, and a scoring system. It may or may not be right. If, if, I, if my thesis is correct, this is an inaccurate map. You don't really care. I better be careful here, but I'll say it. You don't really care what the Constitution is or what the balloting system is. What you really care is the culture of those people. And I would say a better barometer for democracy than, you know, whether there's a representative system of government or whether there's universal suffrage is how many voluntary associations sprang up in this community in the last 12 months. How many book groups has Riley Hospital for Children spawned in calendar year 2012? 50? 10? 5? One, I don't know the answer to that, but if you want to know the health of Riley Hospital for Children or IU Health or Center Township of Indianapolis, that's the kind of question you'd have to ask. And if we had a Ben Franklin in our midst, you better believe there'd be a ton of new voluntary associations coming into being because they don't exist primarily to put out fires or make sure people can get their hands on books for free. They exist primarily as schools of democracy. It doesn't matter whether the streets are swept. You know, whether we have a less than 20 minutes response time for a house fire, it matters. But where democracy is concerned, those are secondary considerations. The real question is, are people getting together to have good conversations around great ideas? And that, by the way, doesn't have to mean justice, you know, or liberty. It, it could be... Uh, over the course of the local school board, you know, to what degree do we want all our first grade teachers to teach exactly the same thing in exactly the same way? That's a great idea. What's the answer to that? One answer is the more they're alike each other, the better they all are. Could be. Another answer would be the more they're experimenting even taking some risks in the classroom, the more they're innovating, whether or not their ideas are good, the more engaged they and their students will be in what happens in the classroom and the more likely those students will be someday uh, to serve as fit citizens of a democracy. Question in the back, please. Oh, right. 